started. Welcome to a uh, Ski Institute Distinguished Lecture today. We're uh, very happy to have Bernard Prime here from the University of Magdeburg. He's a, a professor of computer science in the Department of Simulation and Graphics there, and he leads a group that works a lot on biomedical simulation and visualization. He is the uh, co-author of this great book, Visualization in Medicine. If you don't have it, uh, you should run out and buy one right now. Um, or you could wait a little bit because the second edition is being worked on uh, right now, I'm told. Uh, but you would have to wait a, a couple of years for it to actually uh, to appear. So Bernard has uh, uh, graciously come out here on his way to the IEEE Visualization Conference, which is in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, so, uh, 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 so it was a very nice little side trip that uh, he was able to take, and we, we very much appreciate it. He's going to talk about some of uh, his uh, work in visualization uh, of blood flow from, from images, and I think it'll be very interesting to many people here at SKI. So uh, thank you, Bernard. Yeah, thank you, Chris, first of all, for the very kind introduction and also for the kind invitation. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I could see a couple of demos and it's amazing how many disciplines and experts of many disciplines are here. So that's really nice. Yeah, I want to talk about the visual exploration of blood flow data. The focus will be indeed on cerebral aneurysms. That's a particular kind of vascular disease, but I try to be as general as possible. And before I start with this, I will give a short overview on what our group is doing. Um, we have a couple of projects which are more or less all in the medical domain. That is probably because I'm married with a radiologist and also worked for a long time for an institute where we only did medical applications. So one of the things we are interested in for a long time is to use illustrative visualization techniques, change colors, silhouettes, um, hatching and stippling, and also to um, yeah, evaluate these techniques um, together with psychologists. So when I write perception-based medical visualization, then I mean that we work together with an expert in psychology in order to evaluate these different techniques. We are also very much interested in 3D interaction, both software, um, that means um, interaction techniques for 3D rotation, object placement, instrument placement, for example, like um, here is an, a needle inserted into the spine area that is part of a minimal invasive surgical spine trainer, but also in the hardware that means we try to use as good as possible tactile feedback and um, 3D input devices. Another branch of our work which started more recently in 2008 was augmented reality and intraoperative visualization. More and more um, surgeons are interested in having intraoperative support, not only preoperative planning, like a car driver wants to have support in his car. Um, so we came up with a couple of methods to overlay data which we have derived pre-operatively during an operation. To be honest, neither this nor that is a patient. This is obviously a phantom and this is um, an animal uh, surgery. Yeah? So we are not that yet in the stage where this could be applied um, to real patients. Um, you certainly know that there is a um, wave um, started in the US and led primarily by Jim Thomas on visual analytics, combining visual exploration techniques and analysis <laughs> techniques. And this wave also exists in Germany. We have um, a large priority program on scalable visual analytics. That is a very raw um, event that many visualization groups can work together. And um, within this priority program, we deal on the one hand with biological data, this can be seen at the this week, um, yeah, next week, um, and also with perfusion data, which is a kind of medical data which changes over time, where many parameters are derived which characterize perfusion, and visual analytics techniques um, are used in order to better understand how these parameters relate to each other, um, which of them should be used for a diagnosis. Um, that is the last overview slide. Um, we did a lot of work in ENT surgery, that is ear, nose and throat surgery. That means we want to support surgeons doing, for example, neck surgery. So here is a lot of segmentation involved. We have developed a couple of segmentation models for most of these structures so that 
um, patient-specific model can be created as fast as possible. Um, we have thought a lot about interaction techniques, visualization techniques, also quantification um, of things like two more volume, which might be used for documentation, two more staging, and all the processes involved. Uh, in some sense, one might say that this is our most um, successful work since this led uh, to the foundation of a company. So this is now transferred to a real clinical product. Um, we are also interested in mesh processing, mesh smoothing, mesh reduction, and um, and remeshing. Um, that is essential for many of our applications, and we try to uh, develop methods which consider certain constraints. For example, um, that even after mesh smoothing, certain distance measurements should be correct because these measurements um, might be important for treatment planning. Yeah, now I want to come to the um, outline of my talk on blood flow. First, I want to describe um, why blood flow data are acquired, why this is essential. I want to discuss the surface reconstruction process, which is essential for visualization, but also um, as input for simulations. I want to briefly describe um, yeah, how simulated and measured blood flow data relate to each other. Both can be acquired meanwhile, and the largest portion of the talk will be on visual exploration. That means after we have either simulated blood flow data or measured blood flow data, from this point on this doesn't matter, um, I'll describe a couple of techniques to explore these data. Um, I try to describe the medical background a little bit more general and not uh, focus only on cerebral aneurysms. Um, it might be, at least for me, it was surprising to understand that vascular diseases on the one hand are systemic diseases. That means they occur at various portions um, in the patient. Um, patients have general risk factors like smoking habits, inherited factors, um, and a high blood um, pressure on the one hand. But on the other hand, the locations where these vascular diseases occur are not arbitrarily. Um, but they are at very specific positions, and these can be characterized as positions where the blood flow is either unstable over time or very complex, that means it involves turbulence, highly curved areas of vascular structures or branching um, portions. And this is true not only for cerebral aneurysms, but also for other kinds of aneurysms, for example, in the abdominal area, but also for arteriosclerotic plaque, which is yeah, even more um, important cardiovascular disease. Um, so that is one thing which is essential. A second thing which is essential is that for all these vascular diseases, the treatment options in the last 20 years have really exploded. 20 years before, the only option would have been open surgery, for example, the cardiovascular system that was <coughs> bypass surgery, um, and for cerebral aneurysms, it was open neurosurgery. Meanwhile, there are many endovascular treatment options um, and if you look in the medical journals, it is amazing how much new technology is developed, refined, and validated in order to yeah, modify blood flow so that um, vascular diseases, at, the, at least at certain positions, are really corrected. Um, and what medical doctors want to have is that they can better predict among these many options which are there, which one is the best for a particular patient. If there would not be that many treatment options, it would not be necessary to make so many simulations and other planning activities. And a third ingredient for our work, which is essential, is that hemodynamics may be acquired meanwhile in a very good way. Um, on the one hand, by means of measurements in the cardiovascular system, these are quite good and even part of the clinical routine. Um, there are software packages available which allow to measure 3D blood flow in a quite good quality. Um, that is not the case for the neurovascular system because the vessel diameter there is smaller, that is much more difficult. Um, in Magdeburg we have the fortunate situation that we have a 7 Tesla device, a very special research device, so we started um, to acquire blood flow there as well, um, but that is rather rough. But what is of course possible is CFD simulation, computational fluid dynamics. Um, you need a lot of assumptions and you cannot verify all of them. For a particular patient, that means you have to rely on certain values uh, which you get from the literature, but still it could be shown that using this information 
helps to better predict um, the outcome of certain therapies. There's a lot of work, for example, in the American Journal of Neuroradiology, which describes such experiments. Yeah, cerebral aneurysms um, are characterized by a weakened vessel wall, which lead to a risk of rupture. Um, and the incidence of this is quite high, 6%. Um, so one must be afraid that at least one of us also has a cerebral aneurysm. Um, and um, in case such an aneurysm ruptures, the mortality rate is really high. Um, these 50% die within the first month after rupture of this aneurysm. Um, among the treatment options, I recently read that surgical clipping, the neurosurgical approach, is still the dominant approach with 70%, but that the endovascular treatment has increased from basically zero 20 years before to 30%. And it is increasing further. Um, it increases by treating more and more aneurysms which yeah, were untreatable so far, um, either because these are bifurcating vessels or very large aneurysms. These are the situations where it is still challenging to use the endovascular treatment. The endovascular treatment also has a yeah, substantial number of major complications, but it is safer than surgical clipping and it also leads to lower hospitalization times. So it would be um, an advantage if it's possible that uh, the 30% of endovascular treatment could be increased. Most of the aneurysms are saccular, like this one. They have a small neck and then this yeah, white portion of the aneurysm. 90% have this shape. And among the treatment options is coiling, where yeah, such a wire um, is inserted in the aneurysm. There are different um, configurations, packing densities, and the goal is that the blood flow is interrupted so that thrombosis is occurred and this is really uh, occurs and this is really sealed. Um, yeah, this is possible, but not always. For example, if this neck here is larger than four millimeter, this is not feasible. Um, stents are used, via frames. Um, either as support, but also as um, an isolated treatment option. Actually, the neuroradiologists say they would like to avoid the coiling at all. They would like to use only stents. One of the complications which occur with coiling is that sometimes the, the coil um, yeah, re does not stay at this position. It is removed, and yeah, then, of course, it, it cannot help. Um, this is an example of this combination of stenting and coiling where the stent is used just to prevent that the, um, that the coils um, yeah, go away. Um, and this is an example of um, a stent for a bifurcating situation. This is available for abdominal aneurysms, so for this area, but so far not for, for neurovascular systems. Stent design is um, a very challenging trade-off. On the one hand, you might imagine um, that if you would have a stent here with a very, very high density, then you can make sure that no blood enters the aneurysm and um, yeah, this is somehow safe on the one hand. But on the other hand, you must imagine that there are many, many small vessels um, which go up here and there and at other positions and you block these. Yeah? So this should not be done um, because this would lead to very severe complications. So in particular, this mesh density um, is um, an interesting trade-off. This is an example of successful treatment and it also introduces the imaging technique which is most frequently used by the medical doctors, that is angiography, digital subtraction angiography. So basically you see something um, where a contrast agent arrives and that is in the vascular structures and that is um, yeah, the control after a few days and this um, aneurysm fortunately could be treated successfully with coiling. During the intervention, um, neuroradiologists uh, use these angiographic devices. That is a modern B-plane angiography, very flexible C-arm, um, and yeah, they have interesting facilities to control the visualization. They have eight monitors here, so this gives you plenty of opportunity to make nice visualizations. Um, but of course, the user interaction is quite challenging. Um, this is an enlarged version of this um, small yeah, facility they have to, to interact with these eight displays. Um, and we are currently discussing with Siemens in a project to, to improve this kind of user interaction because this is very difficult. Um, the radiologists there are in a sterile situation. Yeah, they have um, 
gloves and then this is not very comfortable. We think about um, gestures for, for this purpose. Yeah, primarily we use for our work either magnetic resonance angiography data or CT angiography data. Angiography means that a contrast agent is inserted in order to enhance vascular structures, <coughs> but we also have some data um, which are called time of flight data. That is a yeah, very sophisticated MR acquisition technology where vascular structures become visible without a contrast agent. Sometimes this is important because not all patients can, can tolerate the contrast agent. Yeah. The data size is, size is not very large, yeah, that, that can be handled quite well. Um, a few general remarks um, about the evolution of aneurysm. Many questions are still open, but it is clear that genetics plays a role. Also biomechanics of the vessel wall, these are things we cannot um, consider and cannot contribute to, but the morphology and the hemodynamics are the two aspects we can consider. And the hemodynamics is derived either from simulation or from measurement. Um, so one could say, well, see if these simulations are possible, they are, there are tools in order to explore the results, like fluent, um, but these are not very well adapted to the specific problems um, in, in vascular diagnosis and treatment, but instead more adapted to the needs of flow experts. So we did a lot of, um, yeah, methods in order to better understand the workflow of the clinicians. We observed them do, doing such um, interventions. We um, yeah, made a couple of interviews and we derived scenario descriptions, natural language descriptions, where we wanted to yeah, describe as clearly as possible the use cases, how um, yeah, our technology might be useful. Um, also, we did a lot of sketching. For some of the things I will show later, we had many, many sketches of layouts where we think about yeah, how should we really present the information. Primarily, we aim at experts in biomedical research and medical engineering and only in the second stage at neuroradiologists in, in clinical routine. Yeah? They, they have different um, yeah, requirements. What I present in the following was largely developed within the framework of a small national project which was called Mubistan, and five groups were part of this project. Our tasks were first to come up with a reconstruction and remeshing as input for the CFD simulation and also um, the visualization of the results. Yeah? The focus in our group lies on the exploration of the um, simulation results, so I will talk a little bit more about this part, but also briefly mention some yeah, hopefully interesting aspects of um, the first part, the reconstruction part. Um, we have a pipeline of steps which is yeah, quite typical, I would say. Um, other groups have a similar pipeline. We select a region of interest, do some kind of pre-processing to enhance vascular structures. Then, in most cases, an intensity-based thresholding is sufficient to, to yield the vascular structures and the connected component analysis gives you the, the largest of these structures. We apply a morphologic dilatation in order to uh, increase this a little bit, then we get a mass which we use to go back to the original data and then we apply the marching tubes algorithm or a similar algorithm to the original data which gives quite good triangle nets um, which we could use for further processing. Further processing definitely includes inlet and outlet clipping, that means we restrict the domain where the simulation should uh, take place as much as possible because otherwise it takes too long and then it is definitely necessary to apply a remeshing in order to improve the triangle quality in particular at these clipping planes which we insert you see right here these triangles are not very good with respect to their um, EQ angle skewness. Um, where to cut the geometry is a difficult task where it is not always clear also in the literature what is a good recommendation um, also how we can achieve visual accuracy, smoothness and um, yeah, a low number of triangles as input for um, the internal meshing. These are some of the things we think about a lot. Um, we have used for generating these kinds of visualization a variant of the marching cubes 
algorithm, um, not marching groups, MPU implicit algorithm. This was developed at the Max Planck Institute in Saarbrücken, um, originally for um, generating good surface visualization from point sample data. I saw in one demo the Michelangelo uh, data set, the statue. That was, for example, um, yeah, visualized with this MPU implicit variant. And we basically yeah, interpreted the boundary of the segmentation result as a point set and then could apply this method as well. Um, when you compare this with the marching cube results, it leads to, to better results and we can control the accuracy quite well. So we can rely on the fact that we don't introduce considerable error here. It is nice to see that another group, a Chinese group, um, improved our algorithm um, in a very smart way. They uh, made this curvature dependent and this allowed them to reduce the number of triangles generated um, without degrading accuracy and smoothness and also they could ensure that they um, indeed generate a very good triangle quality. So we use this as input for a remeshing um, algorithm, whereas these guys are able to, to um, avoid this step. Yeah, remeshing is something which is certainly known to, to most of you. It involves um, several steps um, which yeah, make a bad triangle strip better in the sense that more equilateral triangles arise, avoiding long edges is an essential part collapsing small edges and also collapsing small triangles. So as a consequence, the triangle number is often reduced. It is less than before. Actually, we use a remeshing algorithm which um, was um, developed here at the Ski Institute. I'm not quite sure who the first author was, but it was work where Claudio was involved. Yeah? Um, and here you see um, one of the results. This was a surface model before remeshing and the triangle quality was in particular bad at these clipping planes and it could be significantly improved. This color coding here indicates that the quality is basically good as it, if, if you see these colors whereas yellow and, and magenta are bad and really would lead to problems in the simulation. Yeah, we also have done some experiments about the triangle complexity which is necessary. It was yeah, a bit surprising to us that the difference between these two resolutions was that small. Um, so in most of our cases, we generate models with approximately a quarter of a million triangles. And this leads to yeah, two million um, tetrahedra or prisms and tetrahedras in the internal simulations. Yeah, I want to describe a few problems which um, might occur in this surface reconstruction process. Um, and as example, I want to use this particular vascular tree, which was derived from a <coughs> CT data set. And one typical artifact which occurred there is visible here. You see here a large vessel and a lot of contrast agent was accumulated there. And then you see these small vessels here. If you would take this for granted, then you must think that the person has a stenosis here and there. But this is not true. Um, the signal there is just overshadowed by this large vessel here. So this needs to be corrected. You might imagine that the hemodynamics would be strongly influenced by the narrowness of, of these vascular structures. Now that was one of the problems for the simulation. And here's another problem which is more essential if we want to generate not only yeah, virtual models but also build physical phantoms which we often do for validation purposes. And then it turns out that these the aneurysm here and the parent vessel are too close to each other um, and this needs to be corrected. So and, um, as we are not a very smart uh, geometric modeling group, we just look for the best tools available we find um, and use them and combine them for solving these problems. Blender is one of the tools um, we used in order to increase the distance here which was necessary, that is the color coded region here and also to enlarge these side branches. Um, some gaps occur in this process and MeshLab is a tool which is quite good in closing them. Um, and we later have to smooth these regions um, and also to remesh them. You see here that um, here is a much larger triangle density in this area and also in this area where we applied these corrections. Um, and this would lead to a very inhomogeneous triangle size which is not acceptable for the simulation. So here is the remeshed version which is accomplished with the Sculptress tool. And one more 
problem is visible. I think it's the smoothing shown again. This problem I wanted to highlight also is seen here. These are small side vessels which actually start here, but there was not enough contrast agent so that they could be segmented, but they lead to these bumps here at the surface. And, and bumps again would lead to turbulent behavior. If these bumps are not real, then of course we should um, avoid them and again smooth them out. The last slide with respect to this, um, these reconstruction problems is this one. Um, here again we have a vascular structure um, which yeah, has somehow an unfortunate configuration at least for rapid prototyping. This is the correct representation of the anatomy, um, but this is again too close to each other and this illustrates a little bit how we have changed the geometry in close collaboration with the neuro of radiologists which tell us which kind of um, changes we are allowed to do before um, yeah, the results are no longer plausible. Yeah, we have another graphics group in Magdeburg led by Holger Teisel and we really think about working together so that this group might come up with a vessel modeling tool which somehow integrates these steps we do manually which, yeah, which is not at all a streamlined process. I also briefly want to mention one, one um, kind of competition we are taking part. Um, most of you have heard about the VIS contest, which is a nice thing. Um, and the contest here is the virtual intracranial standing challenge that takes place every second year, um, three times so far. And participation is very well, approximately 50 groups take part. And you get a data set, um, usually a couple of MR sequences. Um, with an aneurysm and you should come up with a virtual standing solution for this patient and uh, should provide CFD simulations in order to predict um, the results. So for us this is a yeah, really nice team building effort so all the groups have to work together um, to come up with a good solution here. First um, the surface reconstruction then we have to deform the meshes of course because if the stent is inserted this changes the geometry of the vessels and then simulation grid is um, generated and here you see just the, the output of the FEM tool. We were quite proud that we were selected among the six groups to present in the final in, in Houston um, and actually we were the, the only group which was not involved in the organization of the contest <laughs> which was selected to present at this final. Yeah, here's um, an example of clinically interesting situations, that is a study our neuroradiologists are now doing. They have collected 15 cases of persons with multiple aneurysms at the same time. Now that is not a very rare situation. As I said, vascular diseases are systemic diseases. Um, that's why it often happens that people have several aneurysms at the same time and we try to reconstruct the situation and also um, simulate um, the, the blood flow there. The clinical um, question here is of course which of these aneurysms has priority in the treatment. They cannot be treated um, simultaneously and at the same time so they want to know which of them is the most dangerous. Yeah, a few remarks on simulated and measured blood flow. Simulated blood flow um, is based on a volume grid. Usually this is a grid um, where you have tetrahedra inside and at the wall near uh, layers you have three prism layers so this allows to come up with a very high spatial resolution um, in these particularly interesting wall near areas and then you make a lot of assumptions yeah um, Newtonian or non-Newtonian um, flow is, is one of the um, one of the things where one can discuss about um, our partners use only Newtonian flow after they did experiments also with non-Newtonian behavior. Um, the, the elasticity of the vessel wall is not at all considered, yeah? otherwise it would be a very complex problem because the elasticity of the vessel wall and the blood flow are, yeah, are connected with each other. It would be a coupled problem, a very difficult problem and uh, the simulation time would be very long and it could be shown that the influence of this um, behavior is, is not very strong. There are a number of more input variables which you must specify, so it is quite clear that the results of the simulation cannot be perfect. On the other hand, you have blood flow measurements, um, which have meanwhile quite good spatial resolution. You need a lot of pre-processing, of course, but this is 
doable in principle, and one might think about um, combining both methods. For example, deriving boundary conditions, some of the assumptions for the simulation from actual, actually measured data. Um, at least in, in my perception, the group from Michael Markel in Freiburg is the leading group in, in the acquisition of such measurements. And they also came up with a nice MATLAB toolbox where they corrected most of the artifacts. So basically, we have re-implemented their tools um, in order to yeah, make use of such measured blood flow data at all. So we have investigated how well both um, correspond to each other, um, at least for a few phantom studies. Um, so the blood flow was measured with the seven Tesla device at 10 time steps, um, which should be enough to, to represent the temporal behavior. Um, it turned out that the flow patterns were quite similar. That was a good um, situation, but um, the measured flow was more complex compared to the simulated flow. In particular, where helical flow occurred, this could be not represented that well in the simulation. Um, the simulated blood flow was more laminar and it always has a bit higher local velocities. Why this is, is not completely clear. One cannot say this one is the correct one and, and the others is obviously a bit wrong. Um, that is not quite sure. Here are a few yeah, images which show how we have evaluated this. Um, what is quite typical in, in investigating such flow measurements is to take a few planes and to explore um, the flow at these planes. One plane was positioned at the inflow before the flow enters uh, the aneurysm and one at the outflow. And what you might imagine is the correspondence of the flow is better at the inflow plane compared to the outflow plane after many things happened. Here's a comparison of how this looked like with um, glyphs for this P1 plane. So we also, of course, um, made a quantitative analysis which you see right here. Um, this is the volume flow over time and that is the mean velocity over time. And you see that this nicely corresponds in the first time steps and later uh, the correspondence is a bit lower. That is one of the results which is not too surprising. And the second result is here was the P1 plane, that means this one, where the correspondence in general is very good. Whereas if you see the P2 plane, um, there are larger differences, but still the um, behavior, the, the qualitative behavior is still very similar. So in general, we have the impression that both correspond to each other quite well. Meanwhile, I have no quantitative results, but meanwhile, we could do this also for patients. Yeah, we started first with, um, with healthy persons, but meanwhile, we have also data from two patients where blood flow was measured. Yeah, before I describe the visual exploration, I want to make one remark um, before, um, and that is we want to come up with exploration techniques which are not only flexible, but which also guide the user in a certain way. Um, if you want to guide the user, then it is a good idea to characterize the anatomy in a certain way so that you know a few important landmarks, or as some authors say, geometric descriptors, um, because this allows to direct the user in a certain direction instead of providing complete freedom. Geometric descriptors may be either points or lines or also planes. Um, maybe the most essential application of this in, in medical visualization is the vessel center line, which is often used to guide the user, for example, um, in virtual endoscopy. Um, but there are many other um, examples. I, I only thought about one minute what kind of examples I know um, where certain kind of landmarks are important um, not only to guide the interaction but also um, to allow a systematic description of locations of pathologies which is very important for diagnostic reports for example. So diagnostic uh, geometric descriptors might be used to describe the location of pathologies also to compare different patient data um, they may be used in order to be emphasized. If I know that this, this is an important landmark and I could detect it automatically, then I can change the visualization at the, this region. And what I find the most important is to guide the exploration. Yeah, which kind of geometric descriptors might be relevant for, for cerebral aneurysms? 
Um, I discussed this with Matthias, that is one of the two PhD students working in this project, and he came up with a very good idea, which turned out to be also successful. He said, well, let's go to the neuroradiologists and we asked them they should draw aneurysms and everything which they consider important there. Yeah, and what you see here, not in a very good quality, admittedly, um, are a couple of these lines um, they have used in order to, to discuss um, an aneurysm. Yeah? And it turns out one thing is important is the so-called dome point. That is basically the point which has the largest distance to the center line of the parent vessel. This is called the so-called ostium plane. That is the region where the flow enters or leaves the aneurysm. And one thing they are really interested in is how this plane is divided into inflow and outflow region. So we tried to automatically detect um, the ostium plane. The center line, of course, is also important. Um, and they want to know the, the neck diameter. Yeah. Um, it would take too long to explain how we could um, automatically detect all these um, measures. Matthias wrote two papers, one at the VMV conference and one at the German Image Processing in Medicine conference, where he really, where he really could show that this was successful even for yeah, some kind of geometries which are rather strange. Yeah, that is um, not a very typical saccular aneurysm. Um, but nevertheless, this was possible. Um, and as I yeah, said, this might be used to guide the user later, um, but also to emphasize these features. Yeah, that is um, our workflow for the exploration. So we want to start first in showing the aneurysm region in its spatial surrounding with the inflow and outflow. Um, then we want to show surface features of the flow, like the wall shear stress and the oscillatory shear index. These are probably the two most important. And then we want to show simultaneously the morphology um, of a vascular system as well as the internal flow. That is a problem which is somehow related to what is discussed in the visualization literature as nested surface visualization. Yeah, you have an outer surface and an inner surface, and the question is what is a perceptually optimal way to convey both. The slight difference here is that the internal feature is a line feature. Yeah? It's not actually an outer surface and an inner surface. Um, yeah, and then there is the exploration of the internal flow, um, where I also want to present a few approaches. Um, maybe it's good to start with this image to explain why it is important to show to neuroradiologists um, where the aneurysm region actually is. Um, I remember one session that was in 2007 um, when the simulation guys presented this result for, as output of their um, CAT, uh, of their finite element method tool, and uh, said to the neurologist, that is how this looks like. And then they said, well, that is our world, yeah? And we want to understand how this relates to this. That is um, not very obvious. So, and what we tried to achieve um, was to come up with a method where we use volume rendering and a transfer function which we try to generate automatically, which uses the aneurysm uh, segmentation result as input and comes up with a visualization of the related um, yeah, vascular portions. That is actually a kind of a distance-based transfer function. So we take into account not only a gray value, like in a traditional transfer function, but also the spatial distance to the segmented region. Um, so and here are a few results. We had many, many discussions on the color coding. So the segmented aneurysm is shown here in this bluish tone, and this yeah, tone, which is a little bit more brown, is used for the surrounding vessels. We had also a lot of discussions about how much context is necessary to understand is just the aneurysm is obviously not enough. This, however, is already too much. Um, this was considered a very good trade-off. Yeah? A little bit context of the inflow and outflow region. And this could be done really automatically even for data from different scanners and hospitals, so it was quite robust. Yeah, then we thought about um, showing scalar flow features from the simulation. And um, the, the obvious solution would be um, just to color code the scalar feature on the surface of the relevant portion of the anatomy, which you see here and here. But the problem is that this does not give you a very good overview. 
Um, so the users have to rotate a lot. And one thing they are particularly interested in is um, how is a certain feature if it is, looks like this on this side at the opposing side. Yeah, and that is something you cannot see easily. You have to rotate the thing to find the opposing side. So we thought about some kind of map visualization in order to improve this. One more motivation for this was also if we think of unsteady flow, then these colors change here over time. And you can, of course, not as fastly rotate um, the model um, as the, the colors would change due to the dynamic situation. Um, so we thought about map generations. And again, if, um, yeah, some kind of technique should be newly developed, I think about are there already successful examples in medicine where map visualizations are used. And I think there are a couple. In cardiology, the bullseye plot is very famous to summarize information of four slices um, of, of cardiac imaging. Brain flattening is very often used in neuroscience. Colon flattening was developed by Anna Villanova as an example um, for summarizing virtual colonoscopy, colonoscopy results. And this made it later into a product. It was um, not only a VIS paper, but something with what Chris would consider a success story. Um, and also curved planar reformation is a success story. Again, something which is part now of, of many products that is a kind of map visualization of, of vascular structures. So with this in mind, we thought, well, yeah, maybe we can also come up with a useful kind of map. And we thought about a couple of requirements. The complete surface data should be visible at the same time was one of them. Um, the distortion should be minimized, but of course it could not be completely without, without distortion. And we wanted to show the 3D representation of the anatomy simultaneously with the map, because we were quite sure that the aneurysm anatomy is too complex so that just a map without any relation to the 3D anatomy is useful. Yeah? Um, so and we thought about aneurysms and maps and how they can be correlated with each other. That was one of the examples where we really had many, many sketches of different layouts. One of the early layouts was this, so we wanted to map the flow at this side to this um, face and on the right side to this face and also to the other faces was not considered that successful. The final overall layout was this one, where here the flow of the back side is visible. Um, the flow of the front side need not to be visible because here you have the 3D model yeah, that is included there and here are the other four sides. Um, so we think that this is rather comprehensively. We also have um, checked this in an evaluation with um, several medical doctors. And in particular, they liked that they could see the flow at the opposing sides simultaneously. That was important for them. One drawback, of course, is if you move a feature here at this zone, then it disappears here and appears here again, and vice versa. Yeah? So there is a discontinuity which is not very nice. So that is the most critical border. So and I think it's better to show a video for this. Um, the flat map video that was presented at the Eurovis in 2009 in Berlin. And here you see how the user interacts with this kind of visualization. I should enlarge it. Yeah, he can drag features from the map display in the middle and then they become visible there. That's what the, the medical doctors really liked and what gave them an opportunity to, um, to really explore this. And they wanted that we always um, compute the opposing point so that it is easier for them to, to relate features on the front side to features on the back side. So maybe that's sufficient for the flat map. Um, I also noticed that some other groups used this idea and refined it. For example, my previous colleagues at Fraunhofer Mewes in Bremen used this in order to come up with a tumor map. And the tumor map here simulates uh, or, um, represents the results of a biophysical simulation where a radio frequency ablator is inserted and they wanted to understand the, the heat effect on the tumor. So the red region here is um, the region where um, enough temperature was produced that is 
warm enough so the tumor is reliably destroyed. The yellow region is an area where one cannot be completely sure. And green, usually green means good. Yeah, Here green means bad because the temperature was not high enough um, and this part of the tumor is probably not destroyed. Yeah, I want to discuss the vessel morphology and the internal flow, how these can be shown simultaneously, kind of embedded surface rendering. Um, the, the first idea is, of course, well, if I want to see an outer surface and something inside, I render the outer surface semi-transparently, and then I can see inside. But as it turns out, there is no really good um, transparency value where you would say, I, I see the internal structures very well, but also the morphology. It is really essential to see both simultaneously because the morphology has such an influence on the hemodynamics. Yeah? So then you could come up with the idea of using clipping planes, yeah? but this is also tedious, difficult, so we thought um, there might be better solutions. And uh, this complete pipeline which Rocco presented at the Eurographics workshop on visual computing in biology and medicine last year is uh, probably too, too complex to explain. Um, the basic idea is to um, borrow from concepts of smart visibility rendering. That means um, we want to increase the transparency of the embedded, uh, of the outer surface where there is something important inside. And important is um, everything where we have. Um, uh, lines representing the flow. Um, that was one major idea and the second idea was to use the landmarks, these geometric descriptors, which we could derive in order to emphasize them in the visualization. Yeah? And there are some more details which are more from illustrative rendering without going into the details. I want to show a few results. The semi-transparent surface rendering and the improved visualization um, where the opacity is modulated depending on whether or not there are flow lines behind. And the difference between these two is that the hidden flow lines are here removed, which is probably an advantage because otherwise it is too complex. Yeah? Here are just a few more examples. The comparison of what one could say the standard method with the improved methods with landmarks um, emphasized and with spark visibility rendering small video which shows this as well. Um, it's really nice that one is now enforced to make these accompanying videos for a conference. This gives me nice material for the <coughs> talks. Yeah. So this would be the, the standard approach where you just modulate the transparency and in a few seconds comes the improved version. Yeah. So I think that um, this indeed yeah, at least changes uh, the situation and, and I hope it improves the situation also with respect to the ability to show the internal flow and also the, the outer surfaces. Um, in order to investigate this um, in more detail, we came up with um, a yeah, perception-based study where we asked users a couple of questions with relation to depth perception, spatial relationships, what is in front, what is behind, also flow perception and surface shape. That was Alexandra's work presented at Eurobis this year. Um, for example, for shape perception, we asked users to um, adjust such a gorge figure um, in order to make it correspond to the local surface normal. That is a quite um, yeah, often used technique for shape perception. Or for example, in this image, we asked the user to, to assess which of these portions is closer to the viewer. Yeah? And yeah, it could be shown in this study indeed that the smart visibility derived um, variant was better. With this, I am at the exploration of the internal flow. Um, remember that we extracted a couple of geometric descriptors and could use this um, to guide the user in the exploration of the internal flow. And um, I also mentioned that the ostium plane is so important where the flow enters or leaves the aneurysm. So we have resampled this plane um, and this gives us nice positions where we can start uh, streamline tracking either forward or backward. And use this in order to come up with such visualizations. Um, 
where we can do a couple of things. For example, um, users often are interested in very slow flow or in very fast flow. So we um, gave the opportunity to specify transfer functions where um, the speed of the velocity is used in order to decide um, what should be visible and what not to modulate the opacity of the flow lines depending on um, the, the speed. Um, here, the, um, this transfer function was adjusted in a way that backward flow and forward flow could be separated quite well. Yeah, that was interesting for the users. Um, slow flow is um, particularly critical. If there, there is a lot of slow flow in the aneurysm area, that means it stays there for a longer time. Um, um, higher flow would be better. Yeah? So the slow flow enhancement was something which was clearly motivated by the needs of the medical doctors. Um, that was the idea of separating the ostium plane in the inflow and outflow region. And on this um, plane, we added more and more features to um, yeah, reveal further details of the flow we have simulated. And at least with this image, we are yeah, overboard. Yeah? That is something which is too complex for the new radiologists, which yeah, the evaluation clearly could show. Um, we employed widgets um, which can be moved along the plane to probe the plane and um, these widgets are guided like in, in virtual endoscopy by the center line of the um, parent vessel and also by this axis from the parent vessel to the dome point in the aneurysm. So I should show the final video. This, by the way, all these videos are available on, on our website. I will show the address um, later. So these are the descriptors, the ostium plane, this dome axis, and here the parent vessel axis. Skip a bit. And the exploration is actually performed in different scopes, three different scopes, but in all cases the streamlines are seeded from the ostium plane um, because that is important. So other flow features would simply be not drawn at all. I wanted to show this slow flow enhancement. Ah, here it is. So here the slower flow is enhanced, that means this is primarily visible and here is a lot of slow flow, so this is not a very good situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe that, that is sufficient to show this. Yeah, I want to conclude. I hope I could um, show that the exploration of blood flow is an exciting research topic. It's really something where I have a lot of fun. Um, there are a lot of advances in, in all the major disciplines which are important for this image acquisition, computational fluid dynamics, also in the treatment options. So this triggers this re research. Um, to come up with, with good um, results, it's really necessary to consider not only, as we did so far, 10 to 15 patients, but larger cohorts, because there's such a large variability in these vascular diseases. Um, success or failure of new therapies can only be assessed by, by larger studies. Um, the research which, which is necessary for this is highly interdisciplinary um, and for me this is a lot of fun but I know that it is also a real challenge um, because people from very different disciplines have to work together in a very coordinated manner. A few remarks on what could be done in the future. Um, most of you certainly know that um, in DTI fiber tracking, people started to cluster the results to come up with a more abstract representation. And I think that, that this is also essential um, for blood flow representations. That is a very first result together with Holger Teisel's group presented at the VMV conference last week. Um, we started to think about using lenses to explore the flow like you see here. And we also work with our 3D input devices and also an autostereoscopic monitor in order to support the perception of this complex flow with better output devices also, not only with visualization techniques. Yeah, this is a shameless plug for Rocco's talk at the VIS conference next week where this flow lens will be um, explained in 
more detail. Um, and just one very recent result from our simulation group, they came up with a new stand they have yeah, virtually developed and tested and could show that this stand is very well suited to treat this aneurysm. Um, but for these kinds of experiments, we have so far no really good visual support. Yeah, it would be necessary to come up with good comparative visualizations of different um, stent geometries and, and their results. So these are some of the open problems where much more research um, is, is yeah, desirable and I would be glad if more groups um, yeah, take part in, in these efforts in, in understanding blood flow data because there is really a lot to do. With this I'm really at the end and want to um, acknowledge the support of my whole group where I was happy to present their work, in particular Matthias and Rocco, the two PhD students who work primarily in this project and what you can unfortunately not read here is the website of our group uh, <laughs> www.vismd.de everything uh, which could be interesting is made available there. We have not so much open software like the Ski Institute, but at least we are very open with our papers and images and videos and everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sort of the interventional mm. use of visualization. Mm. So much of what you're showing is looked like it was very computationally intense and, and not the kind of thing that fits in that, that interactive interventional setting. <coughs> so, so where do you picture the applications in this interventional domain? Because this is such a huge growing area, as you know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That is a really good question. I'm, I'm thankful for, for this. Um, I think what I have presented here so far will not be useful for the clinical routine. It is for, for biomedical researchers only, I would say. Um, but in the long run, the goal must be that we can derive um, results from this research which can be used without simulations and without um, very high level measurements like 7 Tesla MRI, which is not available in, in reality. Um, so what we want to, to do is to come up with um, another group in Berlin um, at the Charité with a large database where we collect results and we want to come up with facilities to, yeah, to interrogate this database to see what are very similar cases and maybe it is in, yeah, in, in a certain situation um, that you can really rely on similar results, also um, databases where we um, collect the treatment options chosen and the treatment results. There is, at least in Germany, a growing trend in, in what might be called data-based data database based, um, <laughs> um, patient um, uh, treatment. So the, the social insurance sponsors projects where many, many of these results are collected in a standardized way to, to use in, in treatment, to lead to more standardized treatment. And that's why we also hope that we get some, some funding for this. I think this is probably the only chance. I had not the chance to see so far a CFD tool which um, is provided by Siemens. Um, so they came up with very, very simplified simulations which could be um, applied, um, carried out in a couple of minutes. So if this is really true and they are not, not too simplistic, then this might be used in, in the reality as, as well. But you are perfectly right, the long-term goal must be patient treatment and not these nice visualizations. Other questions? So I had a question. Mm -hmm. it, it, we are very familiar here with this, this pipeline yeah. of image-based yeah. modeling, simulation, yeah. visualization mm -hmm. for, for some clinical applications. Mm -hmm. Where do you find the biggest bottlenecks in terms of the, 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 the steps that take you the longest? Is it the segmentation? Is it the mesh generation? Is it the simulation? Or what, what's, what's most computationally or personally intense as part of that pipeline yeah. workflow? I would mention two things. First is uh, really the generation of the input meshes, in particular if artifacts are there and need to be considered. If it's not this straightforward process of basically 
um, intensity-based thresholding and then coming up with, with surface meshes from this. And usually it's not that simple. So, so the problems I, I have mentioned occur quite often. For me, this becomes always clear when I say to, to Matthias and Rocco, I would like to see some new results and, and use them for, for my, my pictures. And I say, well, we have more data sets, but it takes so long yeah, to prepare them. Um, so obviously there's a lot of pain involved and the simulation, of course, also. But I have the impression that in the simulation it is more computational intensive and it is not that um, manually, there is not so much manual work in, involved. So the volume grid is generated more or less automatically. It is relatively raw. I was told from them that they had to, co to correct some, some settings to come up with, with good volume grids. In the literature, um, the, the summary was not more than 2%. Yeah. And, and in no cases they could observe qualitative changes of the flow. Uh, only the quantities changed a bit, but, but not the quality of the flow. Sorry, would we increase the velocity of the Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. What is more essential is that you consider an, an inflow profile um, which is not constant over the whole cross section um, and which changes over time like, like the blood cycle yeah, with the systolic and diastolic phase. Um, there are literature values how this should be done, the Wormersley profile, and this indeed changes more compared to just um, yeah, a constant profile. Okay, well, so Bernard will be, uh, he's got a few minutes before his next meeting and people would like to come up and talk mm -hmm. with him uh, afterwards. But in the meantime, let's thank you for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.